God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours today through God our Father and through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Those who have dwelled in darkness will see a great light. This season of epiphany in which we are currently living, this season between Christmas and the coming of Lent, is a time of learning more about who our Lord is, of having light shed on the situation to further understand, see God's story further opening up to help us not only understand, but also to know and believe and trust in the promises of God shown in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this season of Epiphany, we learn about God's great love for us, how he would have all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, how he sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law that is subject to all of the same kinds of conditions and things in which we live, including those conditions of death. And yet when the time had fully come that he would redeem those who are born under the law. And we know on this side of the empty tomb that we live in that age, don't we? Because that's who our God is. And then you heard in our Old Testament reading a little earlier, and then Jesus quoted again in our gospel reading, this situation of light and darkness. And we see this great contrast playing out in here because the darkness of the world gets overcome by the light, and the people who have been living in darkness have seen a great light shining on them. And yet they haven't run away or hidden themselves in the way that Adam and Eve first did when light was shown on their situation when they first sinned. No, instead... This light shining on us is meant as a blessing. It's a light that shines to show us Jesus. It gives us joy. It gives us happiness. It helps us to rejoice in the victory that God has brought about over our enemies. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think back to those words of Jesus' uncle of some type, we don't know exactly the relationship, but his uncle Zechariah. You remember John the Baptist's father? We hear a lot about him back in Luke chapter 1. And he praises God for what he's doing in bringing about that promise of a Messiah. He says, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. Makes me think of the valley of the shadow of death, right? And to guide our feet into the way of peace. A dawn has broken on those who dwell in darkness. Has it ever struck anybody as strange that this season of Epiphany, which is a time where we talk so much about light, happens to take place at the darkest time of the year? And by the way, if we do ever go to a permanent daylight saving, it's only going to be worse because it's going to be dark an hour later (laughs) in the mornings this time of year. And it's going to be dark. And you're probably tired of the dark, aren't you? Tired of going home and there's twilight at 4 p.m. And it's been this way now for a couple of months. And all you want to do when you get home is crawl in bed and go to sleep because it's dark. And it's hard to wake up in the morning because it's dark. And perhaps you miss the sun. Be thankful that you don't live up in Alaska or northern Canada or somewhere like that, right? And yet... This condition of low light in which we live is coupled with the fact, at least in this part of the world, in the northern hemisphere, that each day, a little bit, a little bit each day, there's more light than there was the day before. Believe it or not, it's getting lighter. 
We are in a similar kind of place, learning a little bit day by day, following in the footsteps of Jesus, learning and growing in what it means to live as one of his disciples and to see in this season of Epiphany what it is that God's done for us and is doing for us. The people who have lived in darkness have seen a great light, Isaiah says. In our Old Testament text, Isaiah references a couple of geographic areas, and those are the areas of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, these are also names, aren't they? Names of Jacob's sons, who later became names of tribes of Israel, 12 of them, and each of them in the original breaking up of Israel got their own land, right? They got distributed land for each of the tribes. You live here, you live here. Well, Zebulun and Naphtali are way up in the northwest corner of Israel. And something that you should know about this area, it is a borderland. And it is not a secure border. It's a borderland, and this is the area that is closest to the sea, the Mediterranean, where marauding hordes from across the sea would come in and try to conquer new land for themselves. And so these were people who lived on the front line. These were people whose security was most shaken. These were people who, in a metaphorical sense, lived in darkness. The doomsday clock was perpetually at 11.59. Who's coming in next? And these are the people who will see this great light, we hear Isaiah say and Jesus say. These are the ones who were most in jeopardy and are now being placed into safety, given victory, and they rejoice with great rejoicing. See, God speaking here through Isaiah intends these words of comfort and hope, not only for the historical tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali and the people living in those borderlands, not only for ancient Israel, but for all of God's people of all times and places, because a great light is penetrating, cutting through the darkness that surrounds all of us. I remember when I was growing up, early in the morning, my dad and I would go out into the backyard early. I mean, the dawn is just barely about to set, and maybe we'd even be out there with our flashlights to be able to see. And we had a very green lawn that needed to be mown like twice a week, right? Because this is Michigan where I grew up. And then there was a place where my mom would plant all of her flowers underneath these large bushes. And it was divided by some long wooden planks. They were almost like railroad ties. And early in these mornings, we would go outside and you'd lift up these wooden planks and you'd have that light first hit it. And what you would see are all of these creatures, dozens, sometimes even hundreds of them, scurrying, moving about, trying to burrow to get back underground away from the light. Worms and grubs and all kinds of other insects. In fact, that was our goal because what do you think we were doing while well, we were looking for bait? We wanted night crawlers to go fishing. And so they were right, I guess, to scurry and try to get away from us. Regardless of that fact, what happened when the light hit them? They panicked. They panicked. The light exposed them to danger. The light shone their position, and they wanted to get away. They couldn't exist in the light. It's a lot like what Adam and Eve did when they hid in the garden from the presence of God. Well, friends... You and I have been exposed to the light. And not just you who are in the blinding sections of the sanctuary here this morning. The light has dawned. And that is not a curse. It is not a curse who, for the people who are under the care of our Lord. We need not run away. As a matter of fact, we can bask in its glow 
take it in. We can hear these other words from Isaiah from later on in the text. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of God rises upon you. Or maybe Peter's words in the New Testament. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. For God has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, friends, this whole season of Epiphany, the texts are reminding us of this light, this dawning that is purposeful. It's not an accident. It's in God's design, and it's sent and done by God himself. God wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God fulfilled his promises to, Abraham, to Adam and Eve and to each of us, and he has set us forward to live in this light. He calls on us and empowers us to then shine that light out into the world to people around us so that our good works would give glory to God the Father to others. The dawn of light has broken upon us. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And when you know that this is combined with God's plan, this contrast of darkness and light is nothing to be afraid of. Instead, it becomes downright exciting. Outside of God's activity, the light is bad. It exposes, it shows what's wrong. It's kind of like the way that what the law does, it exposes and points out our shortcomings, doesn't it? Apart from God's intervention, the light can only accuse. And we want to hide and dig away and burrow like those worms and grubs. And friends, that's why this is in our readings today. To remind us and share God's love with us. To hear God's truth that his light is intended for our good. Not only for our knowledge but also for our love to be shared with other people that his light would shine before other men because God has reconciled the world to himself in Jesus and he's done that for you and for me and he uses you and me to shine that light into other places in this world. And because of him, we have oneness with God, with each other. So may God help us to share with each other that love and that light of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. And now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in faith in Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.